Thank you, everybody, for, for coming this evening. Um, for those of you who haven't met, I'm Jane Mumford, and I'm part of the development team at, uh, at uh, Murray Edwards College. Um, I'd like to introduce to you um, <coughs> Dr. David Willer, um, who is a new fellow at the college. Um, <coughs> he uh, has a particular interest in uh, researching the way that um, bivalves can be a part of uh, a sustainable diet for, for people. Um, he has a, a history in uh, all sorts of environmental issues, including having been part of the British Antarctic Survey. And the grapevine tells me that he's quite a keen triathlete as well. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry. So uh, without any further ado, David, would you, um, would you like to start us off? Fantastic. Um, can you let me share the screen? Yes, yeah, certainly, yes. Okay, you should be able to now. Okay. Well, okay, can you see that? Yep. Fantastic. Okay, so yes, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is David, uh, as I've just been introduced, and I'm the Hensler Research Fellow at Murray Edwards College. And I've been asked to talk to you this evening about some of the work I've been doing, uh, and I do hope you find it interesting. So, on with the story. As an overview of this evening, well, I'm first going to set a bit of a scene and discuss a backdrop of planetary problems that are driving a need for us to change the way we produce our food. I'll then be outlining the unique opportunity provided by bivalve shellfish aquaculture, which is the production of clams, mussels and oysters, um, and the big sustainability and nutritional benefits that we can reap here. There's a lot of potential to expand this form of aquaculture worldwide, uh, but in order to realise that potential, we've got to overcome challenges across the value chain. And what I'll be presenting today is exciting innovations that we've been developing, which can help overcome those challenges and improve production of and demand for bivalves. Um, and actually provide about a billion people with all the protein they need. Um, I really hope by the end of today, um, you will understand how, you know, the world really can be your oyster. Uh, and what you decide to put on your plate can make a real and impactful difference to your health um, and the health of the planet. Food is the single strongest lever to optimise human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. However, production and consumption patterns today threaten both people and our planet. Agriculture, it accounts for about 35% of greenhouse gas emissions, occupies 40% of Earth's land, uh, uses 70% of fresh water, and it's driving deforestation, um, biodiversity loss, fragmentation, etc. We've got a second problem too. We've got a double burden of malnutrition and overconsumption worldwide. There are about 800 million people malnourished uh, without enough food to meet their energy demands. We also have 2 million people who receive adequate or excessive calories, but are deficient in key nutrients uh, and are overweight. We therefore need a planetary health diet. And what I mean by this is a diet which is good for people and good for the planet. Now, in particular, this is going to involve a drastic reduction in our consumption of red meat and highly processed cereals and vegetable oils. We do need to change what we eat. What could the solution be? Well, we are running out of land. Fresh water is becoming increasingly scarce. We need to re reach net zero CO2, as is very prominent at the moment with COP26. And we do need to provide our population with food that is nutrient rich and not just energy dense. Now, fishing could be that vehicle to provide us with food that we need. We've relied upon fish and seafood for thousands of years as a population uh, for protein, omega-3, micronutrients. 
but is it really possible to make use of fish and seafood sustainably? Well, at the moment, the way we're exploiting marine resources is not sustainable. Wild fishing is putting a dangerous level of stress on, eco on, eco on ecosystems. About 80% of our fish stocks are fully exploited. There's a real risk of collapse of all stocks by 2050. Uh, and we're still subsidizing the fishing industry about $35 billion a year to keep depleting this pool of fish. It's not a good situation. Aquaculture, which is fish or seafood farming, could provide an alternative supply of seafood. Um, it is the world's fastest growing seafood sector, fastest growing food sector, any actually. Um, but we really need to change the way we do fish farming to make it more sustainable. At the moment, about 70% of production is reliant upon external feed, um, including fish meal and fish oil. A lot of this is um, food grade, which can, could have been fed straight to people. Um, and even though major production types such as salmon and crustaceans and shrimp are reducing their fish meal and fish oil usage through plant-based feeds, growing these crops just places further stress on very limited land and freshwater supplies. Now, bivalve agriculture, which is the farming of clams, mussels and oysters, could actually be part of a solution to make aquaculture a lot more sustainable. Bivalves, so for the majority of production, you don't need to feed them. They just obtain nutrients from filter feeding. And in the small bits of production where you might use feed, you can derive this from marine algae, uh, the production of which places you know, no stress on terrestrial ecosystems. And I'll be delving into a bit more detail on this on the next few slides. So have a look at the start plot here. This shows the land use, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, the fresh water use, and the eutrophication potential, also known as aquatic nutrient pollution of our common foods. Now, look at that tiny blue polygon in the center. Bivalves have the smallest environmental footprint of all our animal-based foods, and on some indices, even plant crops like soy and rice. Um, in fact, instead of damaging our ecosystems, bivalves actually act as ecosystem engineers. The reefs can provide us with coastal protection, uh, with nursery habitats for fish, and instead of polluting our aquatic ecosystems, uh, bivalves actually use some of those nutrients to grow and in turn increase water quality. Not only this, but bivalves also have a superior nutritional profile compared to most other foods. Just look at that very big blue polygon this time. They've got higher protein content than beef. They're rich in omega-3, and they're also the richest source of key micronutrients such as vitamin D, B12, iron, vitamin A, selenium, zinc. And there is, you know, outstanding potential to sustainably expand bivalve aquaculture worldwide. Just look at the map here. This shows the available coastline suitable for productive bivalve aquaculture. If we developed just 1% of this, we could provide a billion people with all of their protein. That's enormous potential. And moreover, the expansion opportunities for production are really high in the regions where nutrient-rich food is needed the most. Areas like Africa, India, these regions have a lot of coastline um, suitable for high productive biomal agriculture. And developing that 1% will provide over 400 million people in Africa and India alone with all that protein. So we have this idealized vision, but how can we actually make it a reality? Well, there are two really big challenges that we need to tackle. Firstly, how can we produce enough of this incredible food on a global scale? And secondly, how can we stimulate demand and encourage consumers to eat bivalves instead of less sustainable, less healthy foods? 
we need improvements across the value chain, uh, including innovation in hatcheries, grow out systems, harvesting, uh, storage, processing, distribution, and retail. Now, to work out how to increase production of bivalves, we first need to understand how bivalves are produced and identify where key bottlenecks are. Bivalves start their life as a free swimming larvae. Um, they then settle down on rocks or on the seabed and they start to form a shell, growing into what we call bivalve seed. This seed is then placed onto ropes or cages in the ocean by, by, by producers and grow into adult over, adults over a couple of years before we then harvest the bivalves and ship them off to consumers. So bottlenecks. The first major limiting step in production systems is that supply of seed. Now we can harvest seed from natural reefs, but supplies are low and harvesting itself can damage ecosystems. We have an alternative, which is to use hatcheries to grow bivalve seed. But hatcheries are expensive and inefficient to run at the moment. And a primary reason for this is a reliance upon live algal feed to feed juvenile bivalves. Uh, these feeds are incredibly expensive, making up about 50% of hatchery costs, and they're poor quality and very susceptible to, con to contamination. Not good. Therefore, um, our team at the University of Cambridge tried to come up with a solution, a better feed. And what we developed was a sustainable, cost-effective and highly palatable food for juvenile bivalves, a micro-encapsulated diet we named biobullets. So what is a microencapsulated diet and how do we manufacture it? Well, what happens is that we bring together a custom formula of nutrients, perfect for bivalve nutrition. And this includes a mix of sustainable algae alongside a specialized waxy encapsulant. We then fire this mixture through something called an ultrasonic atomizing nozzle. Uh, into a special cooling chamber, and this allows the formation of perfect spheres of a certain size and shape. Um, and then, as a final shape, a final step, sorry, we add a proprietary coating, and this just makes the capsules really attractive and quite tasty to mussels and clams, for example. And these feeds are really cost-effective and sustainable. Uh, the carbon emissions, energy footprint, and costs are an order of magnitude lower than any live algae you can grow in a hatchery. Uh, the capsules can be mass manufactured, they're shelf stable, easy to transport, and they're very resistant to contamination, reducing the risk of affecting your bivalve stock through contaminated feed. And overall, this all reduces the skill level needed on each hatchery site. A key question, of course, is whether these microencapsulated feeds actually deliver um, real world results in terms of juvenile growth and hence the supply of seed? Well, the answer is yes. And we demonstrated this in our research. So what we did is we fed some of our microencapsulated feed to juveniles in the hatchery and compared growth to bivalves fed on regular hatchery algae. If you have a look at the graph there, uh, which tracks juvenile growth over time, you can see that the juveniles fed on microcapsules, shown in purple, grew about twice as fast as those fed on regular algae, shown in green. And they also have much higher survivorship. In addition, we've shown that these microencapsulated feeds can actually improve the sexual development of the breeding adult bivalves in the hatchery, important for producing seed. Look at the figures here. Now, these are images of oyster gomads. Um, just as an aside for you here, um, all oysters are born male, but they can change sex. And by the time they're about a year old, most of them are female. And at this point, their gonads make up about 40% of their body mass. 40%, yeah? Um, so just worth bearing that in mind next to me eating oysters at a restaurant. Um, uh, anyway, back to those figures. So the top left shows an oyster gonad 
before reproduction begins, and it's quite poorly developed with the gonads inactive. Uh, the top right shows the same gonad after six weeks on an algae diet, and it's reached a relatively advanced stage of development. Um, but if we add in microcapsules to the oyster's diet, shown at the bottom, after that six week period, the gonads are fully mature with lots of sperm and tits. And a key reason behind this is the high level of essential omega-3 fatty acids in that feed. The microcapsules are also quite clever because they enable us to fortify bivalves with additional nutrients. Look at the graphs here. What we did here is we demonstrated that bivalves can be fortified after harvest with microcapsules containing vitamin A and D, and that serving of just two of these bivalves would actually contain enough vitamin A and D to meet your RDA. Um, now, why, more widely applying this approach could, could enable targeted fortification to tackle nutritional deficiencies directly through the food supply in a highly bioavailable form. It could also increase the market value of bivalves and improve sales, which would help with the demand. So we've now explored how new microencapsulated feeds could help us improve production. But there are more steps required as part of improved production. A key step required in increasing bivalve production is the expansion of grow-out grow operations. Uh, thankfully, there are numerous opportunities for doing this, which I'll now go on to explain. Our first option is just basically expand conventional coastal or offshore production systems. We've got many opportunities to do this worldwide with about a million and a half kilometers square of coastline suitable for this, about six times the size of the UK. And with careful design, we can make these operations very productive and beneficial. Uh, if we locate production in areas with high agricultural nutrient runoff, this supports high levels of algal growth uh, and encourages fast bivalve production. We can also build offshore bivalve farms by placing cages around and below offshore wind farms, allowing us to combine green energy production with sustainable food production. Now, just as a kind of case study to demonstrate the potential of this, uh, let's look at China for a minute. So in 1950, bivalve production in China was pretty minimal, at about 10,000 tons a year. But they then decided to very, very heavily invest in hatcheries, seed production, and grout. Uh, and as, as a result, um, production has now ballooned to 14 million tons a year, uh, to the extent that China is now responsible for 85% of global production. Look at that graph on the right of the page. Now, turn to Africa. Africa today is in a very similar position to China was in the 50s but it actually has a far greater potential area for production than China had. Since 2005, China has invested about $300 billion into Africa, uh, primarily in food and resource production. Further investment is planned. Perhaps directing some of this towards bivalve aquaculture could really turn Africa into quite a powerhouse here. As well as expanding coastal production, there are also opportunities to expand bivalve grow out via establishing urban bivalve aquaculture. Urban aquaculture involves rearing animals in environmentally controlled tanks to enable exceptionally high growth rates and also to allow full control of water quality to maximize food safety. Uh, and it can also allow production of nutrient rich seafood by communities without access to the sea. Urban aquaculture exists for fish, but not yet for bivalves. One of, my, one of my PhD students is undertaking some really great research on this topic. And as well as improving growth rates and food safety, it does appear that there are further opportunities to improve bivalve nutritional quality and also taste 
So do just watch this space. Is there anything else that we could do to increase production? Well, yes, there are things we could try. And if we can kind of pull them off and think outside the shell, it could drive a rather revolutionary step change in production. We're currently working on a project aiming to grow clams without a shell. This involves using a species known as Teredo clams, um, which were once actually marine pests. They used to burrow into wooden ships and cause hull damage. Uh, in the days of kind of modern marine engineering, this issue is not really a problem anymore. Um, but there now is an option to turn this previous pest into profit. Uh, these terrain clams grow incredibly fast. They can reach about a quarter of a kilo within six months. That is a lot faster than your average clam. And they will be very, very sustainable to farm. They can just be fed on the cane wood or algae. So our research team is currently working alongside universities and industry partners to pilot safe and controlled systems for farming terrain clams and also to assess the nutritional value and palatability of the organisms that we grow. As a food, terrain clams are a popular delicacy to select few Philippine cultures that consume them. Um, and we hope that with further innovation to increase demand for bivalves, as I'll be discussing shortly, terrain clam meat could become a more popular component in seafood dishes worldwide. So we've now explored numerous ways to increase production, ranging from novel feeds to urban agriculture to shellless clams. But increasing production is just part of the story. In fact, it will serve very little purpose unless we can actually work out ways to drive demand. So that's where I'll be heading next. So we want to increase demand. Well, how do we do that? There are two major approaches. Firstly, we can promote the consumption of bivalves as they are in traditional dishes and recipes. And secondly, we can apply innovations in food processing and technology to drive change. And both approaches do have their place. Our first approach, increase bivalve consumption in a more natural form. Uh, this can involve work with high profile chefs to make the general population much more aware of the exciting and delicious recipes that can be made using things like clams and mussels. Imagine Jamie Oliver presenting you with his quick and easy clams and garlic butter, or Nigella Lawson describing a tasty clam linguine with white wine sauce. These efforts can increase consumer confidence and knowledge in actually preparing what is seen by many as an unfamiliar food. And our research team is currently working alongside college canteens on this very topic. We're aiming to identify mechanisms that can enable bivalve-based meals to achieve comparable sales to the less sustainable meat or fish options that they might replace. Interventions we're trying include improved labeling to promote nutritional and carbon footprint advantages, uh, alongside integration of bivalve meat into foods that people are more familiar with, such as fish cakes, pies, and stews. And this leads rather well nicely onto the next approach I'll discuss, technological innovation. As good as simple levels are, such as recipes and labeling, Alone, they probably won't be enough to allow bivalves to reach mass market popularity. But technology can open up new opportunities. This innovation is not a new concept. Um, I'm sure you do all remember the story of corn. Now, in the case of corn, we had a team of scientists led by Lord Arthur Rank, who identified a visually rather unappealing fungi known as fusarium. And they worked out that if they uh, fermented this fungi, um, it will produce a protein known as mycoprotein. Then with further innovation in food processing and texturization, 
they could process this mycoprotein into products resembling beef or chicken, um, which is the corn you buy in supermarkets today. So why is this relevant to biomass? Well, new innovations in food processing can allow us to take a similar approach in producing a sustainable and nutritious mass market food. Um, in this case, not a fake meat, but a real meat, which has been reformatted. Um, now, in the past, the kind of complex structure and different muscle types in mass tissue were a challenge to food manufacturers. But today with new extrusion and fiber spinning and reconstitution technologies, we can actually overcome these challenges and develop food products to fit a wide range of cultural tastes and preferences. We can produce products such as muscle cakes, muscle fingers, clam meat burgers, clam mincemeat, or even meat style fillets made from those shellless Torado clams. At the moment, our research team is actually working alongside Europe's largest frozen food manufacturer to explore ways of doing exactly this. And just why is this such a good approach? Well, by including bivalve meat in our favorite foods, we can dramatically improve the sustainability and nutritional quality of people's diets. Remember those scar plots earlier? Bivalves, higher protein content than beef, but greenhouse gas emissions 30 times lower than beef. Water use 100 times lower, lower than beef. No land use. Just by eating a mussel burger instead of a beef burger, or a clam fish finger instead of a, you know, a chicken nugget, every individual could improve their health and make a major contribution to the health of the planet. And also, by including bivalve meat in our familiar, convenient food products, we do reduce consumer thinking time and effort uh, in becoming more sustainable and driving behavioral change. So just as a little example, uh, imagine that you usually have salmon fish cakes on a Tuesday night. You just get that box out of the freezer, stick it in the oven, and it's done. Um, but you then read that you should be trying to eat more sustainably, and see a recipe for Italian mussel pasta online. To make this dish, you'll have to edit your Sainsbury's delivery, buy new items, find things around stock, plan when to cook the recipe, juggle this around hectic work and childcare commitments. And then at the end, you've actually got to convince your seven-year-old daughter that it's good to eat mussels and are really desperate to avoid that dinner time tantrum. I bet with all of those decision points, there is a good chance you'll decide it's too much effort and stuff it. Um, just imagine an alternative scenario though. You read mussels are more sustainable than salmon, and you see a box of mussel cakes in the free trial next to the salmon fish cakes. You pick up the mussel cakes, cook them, and all you need to do is explain to your seven-year-old daughter that we're trying a different flavor of fish cake. Far fewer decisions to make, much easier change. So, two major mechanisms to increase demand. Promote conventional consumption and carry out technological innovation. To conclude, where have we been today? Well, we first established how conventional agriculture is really wreaking havoc on our planet's environment and on our own health with obesity and micronutrient deficiency. I discussed how food from the sea is very nutrient rich, but the current practices for obtaining it are very unsustainable, focusing on wild caught fish or the inefficient farming of primarily carnivorous fish species. I just showed how bivalves are often an outstanding opportunity with an incredibly rich nutritional profile and a lower environmental footprint than other meats and even many plant crops. We looked at how there was incredible potential for expansion and how just using 1% of the production area could provide a billion people with all their protein. To meet this potential, we explored the challenges to overcome, both in production and demand, and we looked at how novel feeding technologies, new grow-up practices, uh, fast-growing shellless clams can increase production. 
And we then explored how an approach including restaurants and celebrity chefs to increase consumption of bivalves in a conventional form, alongside new food processing technology to develop familiar and convenient bivalve-based food products for the masses can act as really effective mechanisms to drive and boost demand for these bivalve-based foods. So, you know, our population and planet just do face tremendous challenges. But I really emphasize the can be a blue horizon. What you put on your plate can make a real, real difference. The world really is your oyster to make change. Thank you for listening. Um, I'd like to thank the zoology, the zoology department at uh, Cambridge alongside Murray Edwards College for supporting this research and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much David, that was really really interesting. I don't think I have to, I don't have a seven-year-old that I have to convince, I do have an 18-year-old daughter who I might have to convince, uh, but I'm sure the uh, the burger idea would uh, would go down better with her than a, than a uh, a plate of oysters. Well, she has been faced with those and they didn't, they didn't go down with her. Um, can I invite anyone else who's listening to put questions into the chat? Um, we have one here already, which is, um, are there dangers uh, or concerns of non-indigenous bivalves being introduced into areas like Africa or any other area where they're non-indigenous? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the first thing to point out is that in every global region, there are native bivalve species suitable for highly productive agriculture farming. So it's not an issue in that there aren't species available. Um, the main issue is that there are some species which are very popular to farm, which people do like to farm elsewhere. Uh, one classic example is the Pacific oyster, which is you know, pre which was previously just found in the Pacific, Southeast Asia. Um, it's now farmed worldwide because it grows very, very quickly and is popular as a food. Um, so in expanding bivalve agriculture, it will be very important to make sure that communities and nations are using native species rather than just exploiting something which is popular and um, you know, gets a good price. A very good question, thank you. Um. I suppose a question to you is, is uh, how often do you currently include bivalves in your weekly diet? <laughs> the honest answer is it varies. Um, it depends how many experiments have been doing. Um, I think it's uh, probably, like, probably like working in a fishmonger's. If you smell the smell of an oyster too often, it puts you off for a few days. But um, no, I, I do eat bivalves regularly. Uh, lots of mussels, especially. Um, mussels you can do a huge number of things with. And, I've certainly tried those uh, muscle fish cakes at home. Um, okay, are they available in the supermarket yet? Or when might we see those available in the supermarket? Um, in the near future, that's probably as much as I'm gonna say. Yeah. Okay, and on Murray Edwards menu? Potentially, potentially. Um, once some of these staffing issues are cleared up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got a couple more questions coming in from the chat. Um, as an epidemiologist, I've had to deal with a lot of outbreaks involving bivalves. Are you looking at new technology to ensure food safety in low income settings that might be interested in developing this sustainable food source? Yeah, thank you, Natasha. That's, that's such an important question. Uh, and I think there are several ways of answering this. Uh, firstly, um, there is a need to just reduce pollution of our coastlines. So any policy you know, needs to have an emphasis on, you know, improving sanitation, waste management, uh, and that goes a long way to improving safety. The second thing is that there now are a lot of emerging technologies to improve safety, even if your bivalves are growing in incredibly dirty water. Um, so when you actually harvest a bivalve, they are held in something called a depuration tank, which is basically clean water for a few days. Uh, and that helps them to kind of that helps the kind of nasties in their gut and inside them to be washed out. But there are things that you can add to the water at this stage which really just help pull that, pull anything nasty out. So you can add um, things like metallothionines to pull out heavy metals. You can add various chelating agents to pull out um, other contaminants, chemical contaminants, uh, alongside using things like UV treatment to deal with pathogenic bacteria. So there are ways of treating. Um, 
And this is also another advantage to you of urban aquaculture systems. So because they allow you to control water quality, they may be more appropriate in regions where pollution is an issue. Um, a really good question, thank you. Okay. Um, so what about the cost of harvesting biovales versus more classical forms of protein? Is it more, is it more, it sounds quite labor intensive for most oyster farms? It, it does depend. Again, technology is catching up quite fast. It's one of these industries where I would say it's a bit like, you know, agriculture was in the 1800s at the moment. Um, you know, the technology is emerging, um, but it's not being applied much. So uh, take, a, take a mussel farm, for example. At the moment, the mussels grow on ropes, uh, and you basically tow the ropes in, and the mussels then have to be deshelled and processed before shipping. Now, deshelling, for example, is quite an intensive process. Um, you basically got two options. You either just sell the bivalves in the shell, which creates a lot of work at the consumer end, um, or you have to cook the bivalves in the shell to get the meat out. Uh, people often want fresh meat, though. So one technology which is now being used is something called high hydrostatic pressure processing. And that's when you basically pressurize your bivalves um, in the shell, and that causes the meat just to fall out of the shell. Uh, this is actually being done for other kinds of um, food sterilization now, uh, and it's incredibly cheap. So that's going to be a, an important mechanism to reduce labor. Okay. And another question um, about the threat of harmful algal blooms growing in, in concert with the bivalves and the to toxicity that they cause. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Um, so that's a very good point as well. And again, I think this kind of goes back to that pollution to wet point I was talking about. You've got two major mechanisms of dealing with this. So firstly, it's actually um, you know, monitoring, monitoring when algal blooms are going to happen. Uh, and not carrying out harvest at those points in time. That's just kind of the sensible logic. Um, the second thing is that there are now various ways of removing some of the toxic compounds produced by cyanobacteria and algae um, during depuration again. So using some of those chelating agents to actually take those chemicals out. Okay, and a question from somebody based in Canada. Uh, where the issue there is community acceptance of oyster aquaculture and a general NIMBY attitude to shellfish farms. What do we do to get our neighbours and water users to see the benefits of shellfish aquaculture? Those neighbours who currently oppose oyster farms are, come, are talking about coming into pristine harbours. So th this, this is really a kind of a, a media message that needs to go out. So I think uh, people are generally quite unaware of particularly the environmental benefits of shellfish farms. So I think I mentioned in the presentation, but um, you know, your average mussel or oyster farm is a carbon sink. So it's a carbon capture mechanism, uh, as long as you don't turn the shells into concrete, um, for example. Um, in addition, it supports fish nurseries. So you get much, much better fish stocks in that area. Uh, the oyster and mussel farms will improve your water clarity a lot. So if you've got beaches for swimming, you're gonna have much cleaner beaches. Uh, it'll be much more pleasant. Um, and in addition, you know, flood protection too. Uh, we've got rising sea levels, uh, oyster reefs and, and mussel reefs do help to buffer against the risks to onshore uh, property. So I think it's a thing where people need to kind of realize some of those benefits and, and weigh those up as part of that nimbyism. Um, I think there's also a need though for some farmers to become a bit more, a bit more tidy in their practices, you know, um, perhaps less big blue boys and plastic ropes and a bit more, a bit more, a bit more wooden and kind of wooden conventional things. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I think we've run we've run out of questions on the chat, so I'll, I think I'll draw it to a close. Thank you so much for giving this presentation. We've had lots of comments about what a brilliant talk it was. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, if people have other questions, then do submit them to me via the uh, New Hall website and I will pass them on to David. So yeah, thank you again and thank you for everybody for attending. Fantastic. Okay, um, well enjoy the rest of the evening um, and yeah remember to eat those oysters. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing them on the, seeing them on the Murray Edwards uh, menu at lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs>